Swing it is sword let's get that booty. All right, y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Slim Codcast. One more time this week, we got to give you a rundown of what we've been watching, playing, and looking forward to. And we're going to do a little quick recap of E3 for this past week. Everything that showed that Monday evening and forward. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. And let me tell you, first off, I picked up Mob Psycho 100. Mob Psycho is hella dope actually i didn't expect it to be that good and the animation threw me off at first because the art style is a little you know different to say the least but they animate real good like like it's trippy like i'd, I'd be afraid of somebody who was on some hard drugs watching this at the same time but with that being said the story is very good the characters are written to subvert all your expectations and nothing that you would think would happen in anime tropes happens like it just does the opposite on purpose and, it, and it's like a breath of fresh air i loved it i loved it the psychic powers were super fucking good um apparently there's mob psycho 2 so i guess i'm gonna start that and i'm enjoying myself also if i had to give mob psycho season one any type of uh, if i had to give it a number rating i'll go ahead and give it and a plus because fuck number ratings moving on another thing that i did uh, catch up on this past week's of my hero academia episode and i've been watching loki my hero academia however um is basically seems like all the focus is him learning how to master these new powers within one for all and that's dope and all but like i said bakugo is still kind of outshining him but I love it. I mean, it's, it's all right. They grow in, in, in different ways, and I'm glad that they're not afraid to show the fact that Bakugo's public relations is not as developed as many of the other heroes, and yet Deku is so shy and timid that he can't even speak in front of a microphone, so he's just a, a, a brick, you know? So they're both bad at it, but for completely different reasons. This shows a lot of dynamic character growth. So they have their own separate, you know, lessons to learn in order to grow. Now, another thing that I do enjoy, though, before we move on, is the fact that they are not afraid to slow down and take a solid five minutes to just let it be a chillax episode, you know, a Christmas episode, which was all good and, you know, dandy. It was fine and it was wholesome. And Eddie, you know, mingling with the other heroes is always heartwarming. So. It's good to balance it out with all the high octane action and crazy comedy. Good solid show, basically. I I would arguably say that the start in the past seasons of My Hero has a stronger start than the original Big Three Shonens. I mean, it has everything that you could hope for right out the gate. Good character development, which Dragon Ball didn't really get until Super, and great characters that you can attach to, but hold well in the midst of you know great story pacing which naruto didn't get good story pacing well it kind of lost it at shippuden i guess you say but yeah it's it's got everything that you could hope for it's the walmart super center of anime right now and that's okay now a quick rundown on loki uh without giving away any spoilers everything within that whole show is spoilers like there's so much to it where it's like Marvel is pretty much drawing a line in the sand about what they are willing to do and not do with the Infinity Stones from now on. You have your reveals about Loki and his different selves and different timelines and all type of stuff. So I'm, I'm really, really, really jazzed about that. I'm really, 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 really excited about that. Um, the reveal that they had in this past week, the second episode, kind of huge and we're alluding to some things from the secret wars so for those who are interested go ahead and look into the secret wars uh line of comics and uh, find your youtube video on it or read the original graphic novel and if not then just get ready for next week and with all of that before i say and again let's get right on into it and tell you what i've been playing this past week so this past week I was fortunate enough to get a hold of a copy of Spider-Man Miles Morales. And Spider-Man Miles Morales, I couldn't control myself. I, I hopped right in as soon as I could. <laughs> and I started. You know, of course, we were streaming. We were also streaming um, Ninja Gaiden Sigma 
one and two. We're working on two right now, and it, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that that game is on hard mode because I'm just breezing through it. Probably should have put it on the hardest difficulty, but uh, I don't think I can change it after I start it. But more important, we're having a good time, and we beat Ninja Gaiden one this week as well. I forgot about that. So. Yeah, if you want to see those, the VODs are on Twitch. Go ahead and check that out. And while I'm at it, what we've been working on when, when it comes to uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales, I got home, you know, and after getting it installed and everything, starting it up, I, I had no self-control and I just went right into it. I went right into it and I sunk about a solid three hours into it quickly. But... I thought about it. I took a step back and I thought about it. I said, why am I doing this? I should replay Spider-Man PS4 and then go back and start Miles Morales. But I was like, well, but I already started Miles Morales, so it's too late now, you know. But then, like, literally 10 seconds later, my brain was like, man, fuck it. Just go ahead and do it, bro. So I went back to Spider-Man PS4, and boy, I forgot how good that game is. Those moments, the highs and the lows, the good story, great pacing, the characters were well animated and modeled, by the way. Also, it's so jarring seeing that they changed the face actor for Peter in Miles Morales. Like, bruh, Peter, oh my god, Miles Morales Peter is not it, alright? It's, it's, it's just not it. It's like we had Frosted Flakes or Fruity Loops. And then when the sequel came around, they gave us fruit rings and sugar flakes. Like, no. So, I'm just, you know, not hating on the guy. I'm pretty sure he does a good, well, it's not that much of a job having a face. What I'm getting at is, I think I preferred the first Peter Parker a lot more. Now, the moments and the cutscenes in the final act of Spider-Man PS4 are so strong. With the devil's breath getting out and the um, the whole, you know, Aunt May situation and everything going to shit. The whole city being on fire and smoking because of the freaking uh, Sinister Six that don't want to sit down nowhere. And freaking uh, the double boss fights with Rhino and Scorpion. The double boss fight with Vulture and Electro. Like, ah, oh, so good. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that game was amazing. Still is amazing. One could say it's spectacular. But anyway, and now that I've beaten it again, I went right into Miles Morales the next day. And damn, that game is good. I can't I can't control how happy I get when I'm playing that shit. Like, let anybody tell you, you know, from a previous generation or two, you know, anybody, you know, who's not exactly in the know, that it doesn't matter if the hero is black or white, it doesn't matter if they're Asian, it doesn't matter if the main character is this or that skin color, or this or that, you know, um, whatever it may be, you know what I mean? It's like representation, it truly does matter, bro. Like, it, it, it really, really does matter. And you could see that it does by the amount of people who held on to and was excited to watch Static Shock back in the day. We hold that stuff near and dear to us to this day. We're adults still loving the Static Shock cartoon and the fact that Jon Stewart was the Green Lantern in Justice League and a main character with his own personality, traits, flaws, and strengths. Like, I love to see someone that looks like me on a screen because there were times when you see so much of the same that you believe that people like us will never be there, will never be able to do those things, you know? And that's why anybody who's oppressed or, you know, treated as an outlier, no matter what it may be, culture, race, sexuality, all these other things, I'll never, the experience of being black in America will never lead me to be dumb enough to turn to someone else who were, was a minority and say, you don't need to be represented in this, you don't need to be on a TV show or in a video game. I never say those type of things. I'm celebrated for them because I know what it's like to watch a show and feel like who you are and what you are, the two main things that you have no control over, doesn't belong. So yeah, let's get that out of the way and move on. And I'm loving Miles Morales, man. It's literally a whole different world. It's 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 jarring how different. It's like I enjoy video games, but it's almost in a disjointed type of way. Like the way that I 
connect with characters like say Nathan Drake in Uncharted, I don't connect with him as the person because I mean, how can I relate to being able or having the means or even the ambition to just go all over the world and explore and shoot up hundreds of people and be Indiana Jones of the new age? It doesn't fit that way. The way I have to like, you know, relate to characters in movies and shows is by their intentions, their motives, their morality. You know what I mean? Like, okay, the choices that they make in certain situations. I don't love Batman because I could see myself being, you know, Batman or Bruce Wayne, but more because I can understand his choices and why this hero exists the way he does. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And it's, it's way more surreal when you see your, yourself. Now, let's move to the next thing. Over into the news, first thing on the docket is Cyberpunk 2077 is now back on the PlayStation Store after it was removed months prior because of bugs and poor quality assurance. It was removed from the PlayStation Store because it was running terribly, it looked terrible, and a lot of people were outraged about it. Now, of course, you know, this was a decision on Sony's end simply because not only was it a um, influenced by other places taking the game down but also the fact that there were so many support tickets submitted and complaints towards Sony that the game they purchased was not good and they wanted a refund and of course you know digital games do not offer refunds which plain and simple in you in user license agreement you're purchasing a temporary ownership or rental of the title but you do not own the game when you buy it digitally Whereas when you have physical media and actual disc, you own that game. You can do what you want with it. And if you bought Cyberpunk on disc, you have the right to resell it to someone for 50 bucks if you paid 60. But if it's digital, you're fucked. And people don't really get that. I mean, if, if, if people have the expendable income to go digital and not really care about their games to that extent, fine. But digital is not the way to go. And you're all mad. I'm not sad. You did it to yourself. I'm pretty sure the, wall, the writing was on the wall in many, 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 many different ways. And that's the drawback of having digital titles. And one day you won't be able to download them again. So, I mean, that's your thing. But hopefully they're going to come up with something to remedy this as of them almost shutting down the Vita and PS3 PlayStation stores. But they chose not to. Maybe they will find a solution to this. What's up? Next on the docket over on Eurogamer, Metroid Dread is finally real and out in October. Probably my most favorite reveal in all of E3. I've been waiting on this for the longest time. We needed another 2D Metroid. This means that not only will we get a 2D Metroid, but also a 3D with Metroid Prime 4. Metroid Dread looks pretty cool. I'm very interested and it's the sequel to Metroid Fusion, which we haven't... Metroid Fusion came out in 2000 and four three on the game boy advance i remember playing it after getting it from an eb games in memphis tennessee and popping it into my game boy advance and putting my headphones in that game boy and listening to the crisp great audio that i've ever heard on a handheld game with fully voice acted um announcements of uh evacuation and you know uh, uh, countdown imminent self-destruction initiated stuff like that like they had voiceovers in the in the intercom of the ship and shit and it was cool like anyway metroid dread bro this is like what two decades later finally after almost 20 years we get a new metroid 2d and it looks good to me i mean the only thing that i would gripe about the visuals is that it looks a little too you know lego bright colored candy which metroid was always supposed to be a little more gritty dark and serious but not so not call of duty that middle ground between call of duty series no, no no actually no no we're not gonna draw middle ground i'll just say it's more in line with uh hollow knight's aesthetic rather than this current one we have on which feels more mario but hopefully it'll be rectified um coming for the switch on october 8th Metroid Dread, cannot wait. Um, the last one we got was um, Metroid Samus Returns on uh, the on the 3DS. 
made by Mercury Steam. Mercury Steam, the people who made the Metroidvania Castlevania on 3DS. And they also did the Batman, uh, was it Blackgate? Metroidvania on the 3DS, which were both good games. So I'm pretty sure that they are capable in this sense because they gave them the chance, they gave them a shot with Metro Samus Returns, and Metro Samus Returns was good. So Mercury Steam is now settled in in that position just like just like um Retro Studios were. So let's see what they have in store, but I I, I got high hopes for them. So yeah, this is a title that I cannot wait for. Metroid, Metroid, Metroid. Y'all know I love me some Metroid. I'm all about that Metroid, all right? It's one of the backbones of my gaming experience. Next, over on TechRaptor.net, we have Castlevania Advanced Collection revealed via the Australia rating. So Australian rating has revealed that they are trying to get a rating for this collection of three handheld Game Boy Advance titles of Castlevania which was a huge moment for Castlevania back then because back to back there were great Castlevania titles on the Game Boy Advance and the hardware was perfect for it and a Metrovania is perfect for the goal in gameplay. You play as much as you can, you know, do a little bit, your batteries get low, you just hit a save point and you pick it up where you left off later, you know, and it's an amazing design. Um, so we have Castlevania, for those who don't know, Castlevania Circle of the Moon was first, and then there was Harmony of Dissonance second, and last night was Area of Sorrow, probably my favorite Castlevania game of all time. All three of these titles are included, whereas if you don't recall, Circle of the Moon was Nathan Graves, which was just a vampire hunter with that came from a similar family to the Belmonts, but not the Belmonts themselves, whereas Harmony of Dissonance was Simon Belmont's grandson, Just Belmont, or Just, and he uses magic as well as the, he uses clan magic and the Belmont whip. And you have Ariel Sorrow, my favorite, which is about Soma Cruz, which he was like the reincarnation of Dracula, but as long as he wasn't exposed to the dark energies of the castle and the demons, he would not come to be the new Dracula. Because it was said that Dracula was completely destroyed in the previous titles, so he had to be reincarnated through another person. This was Soma Cruz. The reason this is Soma Cruz and Area of Sorrow is my favorite is because, and this is like a, what, yeah, about a 20 year, almost a 20 year old game. So, you know, can't really spoil that. But the reason that's my favorite Castlevania is because you have a choice to either be stay Soma Cruz and fight against the evil energies that are trying to transform you, or you could embrace it and become Dracula himself and be so powerful. They give you the powers they give you, let you traverse the entire castle so fast. You get to literally fly and dash at high speed, jump upwards of like 12 feet into the air and slam into the ceiling. You can't be stopped, period. You even get to transform into a bat yourself and the damage that you do to enemies become health for you you life steal off of the enemies because you're a vampire makes sense everything is so good you even get to shoot the fireballs in your bat form the same type of fireballs that you see dracula shoot in um, uh, um what was it symphony of the night and rondo of blood so it's like they literally put you in the shoes of someone who's the reincarnation of Dracula all inside that Game Boy and the animations were great The weapons were cool. Everything was good. The music was good. The gameplay was good. The boss fights were good It's the best Castlevania out there, bro. It's just hands down hands down. The soul system is astounding and I recommend anybody who likes Metroidvanias or you know Castlevania to just jump right in even if you just like Metroid jump in try Aerosol art you're gonna like it the art style is great it's an anime art style it was more anime than any of the previous Castlevania games it's good all right and if you choose to you know go full Dracula mode the person who's been helping you throughout the game becomes one of the final bosses which is the Belmont boy himself Julius so it's dope like you you can't you can't deny this you, it's, it's the best Castlevania I don't give a fuck what nobody said anyway let me stop gushing and going ahead to the next topic but we're gonna be getting that collection soon so this is your chance to play it next on the docket E3 I just want to just 
glaze over it real quick and just let it be known that um, of course everybody's consensus is that Xbox and Nintendo won E3 and honestly when it comes to console wars it's kind of old these days because of course everybody just gets you know more than one console but to be honest with you Nintendo's reveals I believe were better by comparison simply because they showed more gameplay in their games and literally more visceral things that we could judge off of rather than just trailers and I understand Xbox and Bethesda are working on a lot of things and maybe their next year showcase is going to be astounding because of the games they are working on will probably be ready for gameplay show but as far as right now though Nintendo blew that out of the water with more third-party support great new titles and Metroid Dread I may sound biased of course because the only thing I cared about out of Xbox's reveals were like the Outer Worlds 2 Halo and maybe ah. Uh, I, I, that might be it <laughs> so yeah let's move on but E3 was a very mixed bag and I feel like the most things that I'm excited about out of everything was Elden Ring from the Summer Games Halo Infinite from the multiplayer from Microsoft and of course Metroid Dread from Nintendo and everything else is kind of hazy but you know I'm cautiously optimistic next over on Eurogamer.net George R.R. R. Martin's work on Elden Ring was actually done years ago. They wanted world building, as they say in the subtext of the headline. Now, this thing basically is saying that they wanted him to help build the world around them with the micro stories that add to the macro story or the main story. So, the main story is supposed to have that touch of what's expected to be in the game while the other stories around that build the world and makes it more immersive and that's pretty much what we look for out of the souls games the small stories with the npcs that you encounter with in every souls game really add to the experience because it feels like you're more in the world as the npcs feel like they're living beings in the world since they relocate themselves they have motive motivations and things that they're looking to do so I, I find that pretty good and if George R. R. Martin's up to it then let's see what he's got you know we can't wait you know it's it's, it's optimistic type of thing you know I'm, I'm gonna go I'm just full on and be hopeful for it so yeah in other news very controversial very unexpected and very strange and heartfelt kind of makes me a little sad actually um PCGamer.com, Five Nights at Freddy's creator retires amid controversy over po political donations. Scott Cawthon, the creator of Five Nights at Freddy's, which, by the way, I have always respected, and his game series seems pretty cool. Um, I've always enjoyed the art behind his design via simplicity and making use of all the psychological cues that make horror games horror. And he did a good job with that. I turned it up to 11. Because one of the things that kept a lot of horror games in the AAA market from being horror is that they spent too much money on it. And it's not focused on the horror, you know. But here we are. He, it's bare bones, exactly what it should be. And debatable on certain sequels, but still, Five Nights at Freddy's at its core is a good horror experience. And Scott Cawthon himself stepping down and all the things that have been revealed is heartbreaking. So apparently he made some political donations to the Donald Trump. Um, excuse me, let me give you a di direct quote. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, it said he donated significant amounts of money to conservative action committees and politicians, including Donald Trump. And Five Nights at Freddy fans did not like that because most of the gamer fan base, when it comes to arts and creativity, your fan base is going to be minorities and people of the LGBTQ plus community. That means that the money that they spent on that game was directly funneled into the pockets of Donald Trump. Of course they weren't going to like that when that news comes about. And you can't blame them for that because... The fact that you make these arts, he has the right to do with his money whatever he wants. By the way, let's get that out of the way. But the people who support his works and his creations are not the people that he's supporting with his money. 
The conservative parties are not the people who care about Five Nights at Freddy's or people who are indie game developers and trying their best to build unless it's about business mogul expansions and toppling others via capitalist philosophy. It's not their thing at all. They don't care about that. Your games are solely supported by liberal fan bases. Easily, easily 90% of them. So of course it feels like a slap in the face. And for those who really can't hammer home what I mean, it's it's like saying that you want to make hair products for African Americans and the African Americans who supported this hair product and made your business a success. Let's say it became a million dollar business, all right? And then you turn around and start funding systemic racial systems and things like that or you know anti-liberal or you know you know anti uh, uh, racial inclusiveness you know it's it's completely ass backwards and that's the part that's heartbreaking because i don't feel bad for how stupid he may be but his choices of course i don't know the guy personally so he makes his choices based off of his life experiences and the position that he's in i'm pretty sure there's a lot of peer pressure from him being the race that he is alone so i won't speak as if i know about it firsthand but i will say it is sad to see something like this happen because it looks like a rock in a hard place that just could not be avoided and the way he expresses his feelings about what's happened feels that way and it's a shame that politics cannot be what's more heart heartbreaking than anything is that politics have to have this much damage on the gaming world when it comes to being creative so for creators out there just remember to do your best if you are not along the side of the people who support you just try your best to keep politics out and keep it all secret keep it to yourself the three biggest things philosophy religion and politics just don't share it anywho next on the docket and finally just to give you guys a heads up if you go over to GOG.com, you can get the first postal game for free. Also on the Epic Game Store. If you have missed it last week, there was a Discord Nitro for three months for free on the Epic Game Store. As of right now, the two free games that you can get on the Epic Game Store are is a platform shooter. Uh, full 8 bit, it's not really 8 bit, but it's a full 8 bit, probably 16 bit, I guess you could say. Call Hell is Other Demons and Overcooked 2 for free right now until the 24th. Bye. And then next will be Horizon Chase Turbo and Sonic Mania. So be, be on the lookout for those two next week. And as of right now, on the PlayStation, what is free on the PlayStation Plus right now, actually? I'm not sure. I, I actually don't know. Oh yeah, the free games of this month on PlayStation Plus is Star Wars Squadrons and Virtual Fighter 5 Ultimate Showdown. So go ahead and grab those on PS4 if you can. And if you're on PS5, get those and Operation Tango, which is free for PS5. Y'all enjoy yourselves. I'm out of here. Take care. And always remember the channel motto. Intentions are the most important. Actions ain't nothing but loud words. Don't mean a damn thing. Love yourselves. Peace.